corresponding with the man himself, Eugene Schwartz. <laughs> right. Yeah. Breakthrough advertising, among many other classics. Um, just how did how did that happen? And what what have you what did you glean from that relationship that continues to inform all the amazing stuff you're well, doing today? Well, so so many things, and and there's always two things you can glean some from somebody: their technical knowledge uh, and their character, right? And character being exposed to someone of great with a with of great character can be a very powerful lesson because you know technical tricks come and go, right? Uh, the character issues. You know, those are those are lasting. So what happened was uh, I was and this is an important lesson for everybody. Um, when I got when I discovered, see, I had been doing direct response advertising for years and didn't know it had a name. I just sort of I was starving and I wanted to, I mean, literally, and I really wanted to eat. And so when I did my advertising, I really thought it through carefully. And I, I deduced that the headline had to be good because that was the first thing people were going to read. Right. And then I deduced you better come out, you know, swinging right out of the corner. Don't like walk around the block, like get to your message right away. So I did that. And I said, well, you better have an easy response mechanism for people to reach you. Otherwise you're running ads and people can't reach you. And then if somebody does call you, you better make time for them. And you better get their mailing address so that you can send them additional information. Uh, you know, all these logical things, which are the, the the foundation of direct response. But I didn't know there was a direct response industry. That's how ignorant I was. So when I discovered there was a direct response industry and that a few other people had been doing this, I literally read every book on the subject. I spent a year. Uh, I just read and read and read. And I have, let's see, I want to show you a book. Yeah, and please. I, I almost hesitate to show this because as soon as this airs, this book will never be, it'll be sold out instantly because it's, it's out of print. And um, so guys, you might want to pause the video at this point <laughs> and get this book because I guarantee there's not that many copies left, but this was a really inspiring book. I'll be right back. It's very close. Yeah. All right. Welcome to today's Vital podcast. And we're at the end of the year, end of, end of 2023. And it's been a crazy year, hasn't it? <laughs> So whether you've had a rocky year in marketing or found major success, one thing's clear. None of us truly know what's next. And that's why as 2023 wraps up, it's really valuable to be able to learn from some of the legends who have weathered many, many storms over the years, successfully come out on top. And, and a guy named Ken McCarthy is one of these veterans. He's been pioneering internet strategies since the early 1990s and uh, really Back in 1993, Ken realized online media's direct response potential before nearly anyone else. He was a big direct mail guy and jumped on to online marketing pretty much straight away. So he cracked the code on email marketing and banner ads in 1994, which is crazy. That's 30 years ago. Um, developed autoresponders many years before most other people and was dealing with pay-per-click as early as 2001. Um, he's friends with, he was friends with Eugene Schwartz, was a, was, uh, who was a mentor to him. So obviously breakthrough advertising fame. Um, people like uh, Perry Marshall, <laughs> he actually introduced internet marketing, online marketing to Perry Marshall himself. People like Dan Kennedy, Gary Vincevenga, who are, utter legends when it comes to marketing, direct response marketing, speak very highly of Ken, uh, just an amazing, amazing mind. And uh, just has stayed on top of pretty much everything throughout the ups and downs of the past 30 plus years. He was digging into AI and big data back in two, uh, 2018. Um, and just really starting to leverage that for small business and direct response. So I think like taking a uh, as we look forward to 2024, nothing like taking a look back to see the patterns, the ups and downs that have taken place over the past 30 plus years of online business, online direct response marketing, and really hear directly from Ken about his unique journey and some real strategic and tactical insights that you can apply as you move forward into 2024 and beyond that'll allow you to stay on top of all of the crazy changes happening in the world and in come out on top. So really excited to share this conversation with Ken and let's get right into it.
All right, welcome to today's VidTal podcast. This is VidTal co-founder Ian Naj. And before we get into the content for today, just wanted to let you know that right now you can try VidTal, our YouTube ad library with over 7 million indexed unlisted YouTube ads and landing pages and funnels for free. You can try for free for seven days. Just go to vidtao.com, V-I-D-T-A-O.com and check it out. This podcast is also sponsored by Inseply.com. Inseply is a direct response video advertising agency, and it's generated over $950 million in direct response revenue for Inseply's clients via video platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Meta, and more. They're experts in both producing high-performing direct response creatives, video creatives, and also scaling the ad accounts themselves, so expert media buyers, and very important custom deep data analysis to make sure your tracking and attribution is 100% rock solid and tailored to your unique business and funnels. So if you're already spending at least $1,000 per day on ads and looking to take your results to the next level on platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, Connected TV, and more, go ahead and claim a free brainstorm session with the Inseply team. Just go to inseply.com slash vidtow. That's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y.com slash vidtow and claim a free brainstorm session. And just so you know, this is not a sales call. On this brainstorm session, the Inceptly team will work with you to uncover insights you and your team can use to unlock new opportunities and scale on video traffic platforms. Just go to inceptly.com slash VidTal to claim your spot. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining our VidTal podcast. And yeah, uh, I mean, I, I just got to jump right into the the good stuff. So you were called the one, you were called the founding father of online advertising. I, well, you know, I am, and I can. I think there's reason to to believe that. There's facts. There's data that that supports that. I don't make that claim, by the way. But well, it's Time uh, Magazine, I think, something like that. Yeah. Time Magazine. Yeah. But there, there is, there is backup to that, which we could talk about. Yeah, I mean, so I'm super curious. I really want to want to get into, um, you know, you've been in this game for over forty years in online advertising. Well, on direct response, direct response, direct sure, response. for 40. And then online, I would say I got into it in 93. So this is the 30th year. Unbelievable. I mean, what amazing context for how many boom bust cycles have you seen over those 30 <laughs> years? Just curious. Uh, on the internet, um, well, the big one, of course, uh, in, in 2000. Uh, and then, and then it's, there seems to be an endless wipeout cycle. And, and that's something I always counsel people about is people will find a narrow little thing that works te technically on the internet that they can exploit. And they'll build, you know, nice little cash flow from it. And then somebody changes an algorithm. You know, this has been going on since the 1990s. And it's, it's jarring to people. Uh, so I would say there have been, you know, there's been at least one major crash. Uh, but then there have been countless mini wipeouts as things get turned and absolutely absolutely i mean so what what did you see back let's just take it just on the macro level 2008 pre post crash what were you seeing in the online oh, space oh that crash okay so that there was a the crash in 08 was was more it was a financial crash uh, the crash I was talking about was the dot com crash. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, gotcha. yeah. I mean, it's a long. It's getting to be a long history. So you know, I think it would be helpful for people to hear the whole story from beginning Please. to end. Let's hear it because it, it will also inform folks about how to evaluate the present. So I'm not just giving the history for the sake of recounting ancient history, but if you know the history, then the present becomes a little bit more dealable. Right. And, and then the future is not such a mystery. Right. So just to take you back in, in I first experienced the online world in 1993. Uh, and in those days, it was pretty much a small, really small computer bulletin board services. And then a few big services like CompuServe, uh, AOL, which was tiny. AOL was so small that I could write to Steve Case the CEO and get a personal answer. Amazing. That's how AOL, that's how small AOL once was, right? Uh, and then uh, did I say Prodigy? Uh, Prodigy, uh, Delphi, and each one of these things was a separate island, right? So if you were on Delphi or if you were on Prodigy or if you were on CompuServe, you could only write to other members. 
to send email to other members. So the big breakthrough first, I think maybe in some ways, the most important thing that happened in the internet still to this day was the universality of email addresses. Suddenly, if you were a Prodigy member, you could write to a CompuServe member. And everybody on earth that was on the internet suddenly could communicate via email. And that didn't happen. That did not take root until 1993. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. And then there was no browser. There was no World Wide Web. Everything was text-based. There was no graphics. You know, there was no audio. Certainly was no video. And then, and this is a really important story that everybody should know. Some young guy said, what if we put a graphical interface on this thing called the web? And at the time, the web was text only. I don't know, maybe 100 people were using it. It was, it was basically a communications device between um, high particle physics laboratories around the world to make it easier for them to share data, right? Got it. And so Mark Mandreessen, some people may know his name, some people may not, but everybody really should. If you know who George Washington is, if you know who Abraham Lincoln is, you know, you should, you know, you should know who Mark Andreessen is because he's the first guy that said, let's put a graphical interface on the internet. <laughs> wow. Um, and the reason he had that insight was he had, a, I think, like a $2.35 an hour job sweeping up in the physics lab at the University of Illinois. And he was also studying computer science, but that's how he stumbled on the World Wide Web, because the World Wide Web was just a, a thing among physics departments. I mean, when I say it was a handful of guys, I'm really a handful of guys. And he thought it was really cool. And so he put the browser on it. And the, and the important part of this story is that it took in, within a year, he had a million users or a million downloads. Wow. Now, that doesn't may not sound like a big deal these days because, you know, somebody puts their cat on YouTube. Right. And they've got 100 million downloads. Right. But this was this was a big deal. And he did it by working his ass off. And this is something that people miss about the story. He provided personal customer service to every person that was trying to download the browser and, and install it. Wow. You know? Yeah. Scale, right. Yeah. And that, that's really scale. how. Yeah, I mean, that's you you know this because you have a business. It's not all glamour and limousines and caviar and champagne. You know, it's like a lot of of hard, uh, uh, undignified labor, you know, and I, I'm joking when I say undignified because all work is dignified. But but he put an enormous amount of effort. Now, here's the next part of the story. He get he graduates from school. No one's particularly interested in hiring him. Like. What did the guy have to do? He had a million downloads. He yeah. kickstarted the World Wide Web. And the best job he could get was he was like a junior uh, engineer in this sort of non no name Silicon Valley company dedicated to computer networking. Right. So there's often a gap between like doing something really cool and the world catching on. And, and it can be very discouraging. You know, you can think, well, what did I just waste a year of my life or two years of my life doing? And and it's always a balancing act. I mean, maybe you are going on the wrong path, you know, but maybe you're not. Uh, maybe you've done something really significant and you should just stick with it. So that's a judgment call. Uh, but, very, but I just want to stress that the gap between having the good idea and actually creating whatever it is you're creating and putting it out there is often way longer than we want it to be. And uh, that's an example. For ex I'll give you this as another uh, example. People may not know this, but the internet, it was forbidden to do commercial activity on the internet. Wow. Forbidden. Uh, I don't know that they'd send a SWAT team to your house, but it was, it, it was, it was frowned upon and, you know, people would jump you if you did it. Um, in 1989, the uh, National Science Foundation, which I think had the control of the internet said, okay, new, new deal. You can do commercial activity. And what happened? Crickets. Nothing. 1990. <laughs> crickets. 1991. Crickets. 1993. Crickets. The thing didn't take off until 1994. Wow. So, for some reason, I'm inspired to give this perspective right, at, at, right now at, at, at how ridiculous the gaps can be. So, the the big a bunch of things happened in '94. Number one, uh, Yahoo started. Two guys in a trailer. <laughs> they were just trying to create a directory of the internet. Like, okay. 
everything about dogs, everything about skiing, everything about China. And they just had a list of links. I mean, it was as primitive as it could be. Um, they, a VC found them. And then the fourth guy that came on was a guy named Ed Niehaus. That was a friend of mine. And he was their PR man, uh, which goes to show you something about Silicon Valley and about marketing in general. Two techies and a full-time marketer. You know, in other words, if, if you've got the greatest tech thing in the world, uh, that's good. But you still need the greatest marketing in the world. I mean, I tell people Jesus Christ himself could come back to the planet, walk through Times Square in New York. And unless he got proper marketing, nobody would notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's how <laughs> the world works, right? Um, so, so uh, that's how Yahoo. So Yahoo started. Amazon started in 1994, and by coincidence, one of my best and oldest friends is the guy that Jeff Bezos went to to learn how to sell books online. Really? Yeah, his name's Steve O'Keefe, and um, Steve wrote the very first book on on internet publicity ever and for a brief shining moment he and another guy named eric ward imagine this there were only two people on the planet that were internet promotion experts there was just, and they divided the world between them um uh, steve really loved the publishing world so steve said look eric i want everything related to books and publishing and you can have everything else which is a big big everything else right um so, so once there were just two guys. So also in 1994, I put on two conferences, uh, one very small and one a little bit bigger. And in the small one, we had a guy named Mark Graham who had started out at the, um, uh, he was in the Air Force and his first job, he's about my age, roughly, I'm 63, where he and I are roughly the same age. His first job out of college was, uh, and, and, and as an Air Force guy, was to go work in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Air Force's doomsday program. Like, so all of these, you know, military branches have a doomsday team that, okay, what if it hits the fan, right? And, you know, the missiles are flying and, you know, the whole world comes to an end. What do we do? Well, the internet was actually one of their um, plans for survival because the internet's sort of a self healing network within limits so that's what he was doing every day he'd go to he so he knew the whole scenario of what they thought could happen and he was just inundated in this and finally he couldn't take it anymore so when his time was up he got in a car and he said he said he drove as far away from the pentagon as he possibly could go and he ended up in berkeley california and um he was one of the 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 pioneers of doing a non-military non-academic uh, thing with the internet he created something called PeaceNet, which was the weaving together of all the peace organizations in the world via the internet and that was in the in the mid 1980s he was a real pioneer so i had him at my my my, my meeting and i had a guy named mark fleischman now mark fleischman believe it or not somebody had to be first was the very first guy ever to say i am a full-time professional web designer Oh, wow. The first guy on earth. Then there had been, there was a guy working at Sun Microsystems that had that job and, you know, and so on. But in terms of a guy like hanging up a shingle and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do for a living. And I thought, wow, I hope this guy can feed himself, you know, because <laughs> business was kind of thin then, right? Yeah. So we, so we had um, those two guys and me. And then I had been doing a lot of outreach. And I, I, I outreached to a guy named um, Rick Boyce. And Rick Boyce was working for an ad agency, a really hip ad agency in San Francisco called Hal Reine and Partners. If, if anybody knows the advertising agency business, you know, they're one of the famous old agencies, right? So Rick was a traffic buyer, right? And uh, I said, Rick, this internet thing is huge because I had heard him give a talk. He gave a talk about the fact that uh, traffic buyer for mainstream media, by the way, there was no, there was no profession of traffic buying on the internet whatsoever in 1994. Like that, that wasn't even the vaguest notion of anybody. No, he was a, a media buyer. I really should say, right? So what, what happens, you know, you want to sell Coca-Cola or you want to sell Bank of America and you, you know, you figure out, well, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and uh, time, life done. Right. And what he was, what his lecture, his talk was about, he goes, wow, there's all these cable channels. There might someday be as many as 500, right? This is, this is what we were looking. 
how are we going to do media buying when there's 500 media channels, right? So I thought this is a smart guy. So after his talk, I went up to him and I said, dude, it's way worse than 500. It's going to be, I thought, thousands of websites okay i was a little off right there's going to be thousands and thousands of websites he goes what's a website i said let me visit you at your office and we'll have a talk so um he was intrigued he was intrigued do you, do you know the book the standard rate data service it's like it's like all the mailing yes. the world yeah. all the, right so he has because he's a media man he had a, a whole he had all of them not just the direct mail ones but for magazines for um tv for radio it's like an encyclopedia right so he he went up and he pulled one off his his shelf and he said it was said miscellaneous miscellaneous media he goes i think this internet thing would fit here <laughs> wow right yeah so so um so I invite him to our meeting. So we got Mark Graham, the internet mystery. He was literally had the, now imagine this, in San Francisco, Mark Graham had the nickname Mr. Internet <laughs> because so few people were doing anything on the internet in San Francisco. Then we had Mark Fleischman, the world's first webmaster or web designer. Then we had this really bright um, uh, um, media buyer. So we're so I, I brought all these guys together because we hadn't, the world had not yet figured out how to commercialize the internet. You know, people were talking about business at the speed of light. And I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't sell anything. It doesn't put bread on anybody's table. We got to like make this thing pay for itself, right? So that was the purpose of me putting the meeting together. I like, here's some smart guys. Let's sit down and figure it out. So we had this meeting and we kind of got nowhere. Then on the break, Mark Graham and I we're talking with 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 um, Rick, the, the the traffic, the the media buying guy, and we said, "Look, Rick, Rick, there's a page. <laughs> we can put a little square on the page. People can click on the little square, and it will take them to a big page." Wow! And we can count how many people saw the the, the page and clicked on the little page, looked on the little square. Two months later, he quit his job, and he went to work for Wired magazine. Wired Magazine had this thing called Hotwired, which is different than the, the Hotwired today, but there was a thing called Hotwired.com. And it was the, the first business that set out to actually be a real business with salaries, offices, you know, desks, chairs, you know, the whole thing, running a commercially supported web publication, web-based publication. That was the very first one in history. Called, it was called Hotwired.com. Now, now here's the here's the key. Because Rick had been a traffic guy, or I keep calling it traffic media, a media buying guy, for the mainstream of advertising, he already knew Saturn. Um, uh, there was a whole bunch of other companies. I can't remember, but Saturn was one that jumped out at me. And so he just called them up and said, "Hey, there's this thing called the web. Have you heard of it?" And they said, "Yeah, we kind of heard of it." He goes, "I got some ads you can buy." He was getting $200 CPM for, for banner ads. Why? Because he wasn't selling them via CPM. He was just saying, hey, for 10,000 bucks, you could be on this site. And it worked out to $200 CPM, right? So all these other people, because Wired, you know, Wired Magazine, Hot Wired, very high profile. All these tech guys said, whoa, look at the money they're pulling in. And that was the beginning of, of ba the banner ad industry. And the idea that you could have a website and actually pay your rent with it. That's how it started. Insane. And then um, that same year, I did a meeting with Mark Andreessen, who I mentioned earlier. He was 23 at the time. Um, Netscape, which was the, was, which was the, uh, the original browser company, uh, only had eight people. And they were having, now here's, everyone should hear this, man. They were having trouble getting traction. They were making calls on, you know, NBC and, and, uh, you know, the newspaper chains and they were saying, Hey, look at this thing, man, it's great. And everyone's looking at it going, I don't know, man, I'm not getting it. I'm not feeling it. So he was having trouble. They were having trouble. And, and, and so I said, Mark, I'm going to organize a conference in San Francisco. Okay, I'm going to bring all the advertisers and all the tech people together I'm telling you, man, I would go to conference, I would go to software industry conferences and I would talk with software industry CEOs about the web. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Right. So I thought, okay, I'm going to bring all these guys together for a conference. And I did. And Mark came and 
and uh, Mark, uh, Mark Graham came, of course, and Mark Fleischman. They all they all came. Rick was too busy selling ads, by the way, to come to the conference. He was like totally full and, and engaged. And the name of the, the conference was, uh, I'm looking at my poster on my wall, November 5th, 1994. And I was very grandiose. I called it Multimedia Publishing on the Internet, Opportunities for Publishers, Advertisers, and Entrepreneurs. At the time, there was this thing called the multimedia industry in San Francisco. It was like the center of the digital whatever. And this was before CD-ROMs. Oh, wow. All right. So what people, what guys were doing was like IBM would say, hey, we're doing a display at this trade show and we need a really cool interactive thing with a big screen that people can touch and see, you know, this and that. And so people were hand making at the cost of 50, 100, 150, $200,000, these very elaborate digital media interactive. That was the big thing, digital interactive, you know, Um and so you had all these guys that were hand making these these digital interactive things, and then slowly, a commer a, a consumer market emerged for the CD ROM, um, which would be you know you buy a CD ROM, you put it in your computer, and gee now you can click on things and see video, and click on something and see audio. This was unheard of, right? But I told those guys, and a lot of those guys came to my meeting with with Mark Andreessen, and I told those guys, look. Here's the problem with your business. At that time, the CD-ROM was selling for uh, $50. I said, this is not, a, it's, inter it's it's a novelty. People are going for it. But if I can go to a movie, in those days, you go to a movie for five bucks and buy a CD-ROM for 50. And, you, you know, people are going to get bored with that. And meanwhile, you could be doing the same thing you're doing now, digital interactive content on the web. And they all said, no, 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 we can't do it. There's no bandwidth. And I said, yeah, I know there's no bandwidth. There used to be no bandwidth between England and the United States for a phone call. There used to be a transatlantic cable. It used to cost 100 pounds sterling to send 20 words from London to New York via um, uh, telegraph. We figured that out, didn't we? <laughs> we improved yeah. on that. Right. You know, so I said, don't worry about bandwidth. Anything that's a zero and a one. And that includes audio. We demonstrated audio at, at our 1994 conference. It took us the entire conference to download a three-minute audio music clip. Wow. <laughs> we started at the beginning of the conference. And at the end of the conference, it was ready. We pushed the button and we played it. And everyone freaked out. They thought it was like they, the most amazing thing they'd ever seen in their lives, right? So, um, but I always see I, previous to, to to moving to San Francisco and getting involved in the internet, I was in I was in the film industry, and we actually had the second, another kind of crazy, hard to believe this was ever, things were ever so primitive. There were only two audio digital audio posting studios in all of New York City, and I was I was a junior partner in one of them. So when you make a film. And I'm going on and on. I hope this is, I'm not, this, this is, is a, oh, this is unbelievable. Yeah, okay, please, good. Please keep going. <laughs> okay, good. So when you make a film, people watch a film and, and they see the pictures and they hear the sound. They're, they actually get immersed in the story. And what they don't, there's a couple of things they don't know. One is you can have kind of a screwed up, you can have like a the picture can be a little blurry. You know, there could be some problems with the, the video. If there's a problem with the sound, that kills the illusion really faster than a problem with the audio with the, with the video okay um like when you see those those old uh, bruce lee movies that are dubbed and he's his his mouth moves and then you hear him go i am going to destroy you you know it's like it just seems ludicrous so the the actually the audio on on films has to be right spot on that's one thing people aren't aware of the second pe thing people don't know is a great deal of the sound in movies is added after the shooting uh, all, all the sound effects. When you watch a movie now, when somebody's walking over gravel or a car crashes or a gun shoots, or even if somebody gets punched and you hear, a, Ooh, all that is added in a studio later. So that's what we did. That was our business. Uh, but we were doing it digitally. Oh, wow. And nobody was doing, everything was done with cutting string, t you know, with cutting uh, um, uh, strips and hanging them and running them through a thing and gluing them together. And then all that didn't work and cutting it again and re-gluing it. I mean, it was crazy. 
And, and so my, 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 my friend, Bill Markle, very ingenious guy. So our studio was made up of, of, a, of a Macintosh 512. I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, five, I don't even. Is, I mean, is that five twelve K? Like five five twelve K? Insane. Up, and it was an upgraded from a one twenty eight K. Wow! Right. So we had wow. that as our as our brain, and then we had uh, what's called an Atari reel to reel um, tape recorder, and then we had a mixing board, and then we had a Sony RM four forty, which um, the original uh, video format uh, was called three quarter three quarter inch, and it was it was huge. It was ridiculous and uh, but that was the that was the standard for production so somehow in his genius bill figured out how to weave all this together into an audio posting studio and we became the second audio posting studio in new york city which is kind of amazing wow the other guy spent like 10 million dollars building his we spent i don't know five thousand i don't know. um that's another lesson by the way <laughs> If you can spend five thousand to set up a business instead of ten million, go with the five thousand. <laughs> it gives you a little more flexibility. And we we did an Academy Award winning film uh, when we were kings about Muhammad Ali. Wow. We were the sound guys for that. Um, so anyway, that's what I had been doing before I went out to San Francisco. So when I came out to San Francisco and got involved in the digital world, I immediately was thinking video, 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 video. I want video. Give me video, you know. And so I, I went to this pitch in '94. Again, just to give people perspective on how things used to be. All well, not it, it was already a little bit of video too, um, but video or film, it didn't matter. When commercials were shot, so the the guys would be in the field shooting, and then then the the account executive and the you know creative manager and so on, creative director, they want to see what the guy shot. Well, somebody had to take the film, bring it to the lab, develop it overnight, hand deliver it. I mean, it was unbelievably laborious so somebody had this great idea of figuring out how to transmit dailies they're called dailies from the shoot to wherever so you shoot in la but the guy the money man is in new york he wants to see it so in those days you'd put it in the fedex package and mail it wouldn't it be better if they could see it that day so um that was going to be a dedicated service uh it was going to take all day to do the transmission but all day is better than overnight so I saw that pitch. So that was the state of internet video in 1994. Wow. Yeah. So, so you'd be sending, so you'd be sending like a, like a three minute clip cl mashup of what happened that day over the right. internet. Right. But, but dedicated, but you know, so, you know, through, there'd have to be an amazing processor at both ends. And, and, and actually I think we even had to, I think, I, mean, I think the, the guys that were developing this had, we're going to have like, um, uh, 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 an endpoint in major cities because I think it had to be processed as well. Uh, so they were going to be like New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, LA. Uh, but you had to have a lot of processing on the front end, a lot of processing on the receiving end. And but it seemed space age to us. It seemed like this is genius, right? But I, I had a newspaper, uh, a print newspaper, uh, called uh, the Internet Gazette and multi and Multimedia Review. And it was just an eight page tabloid, very interesting print medium, by the way, it's very cheap to print on newsprint. Uh, I, you know, I haven't done it in a while, but we printed 25,000 copies. I can't remember what the total bill was, but they were four cents each. Wow. Yeah. Newsprint. Opportunity right there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I'll tell you, I learned that trick from a guy named Jim Warren. And here's the interesting thing. Jim Warren ran something called the Computer Fair, F-A-I-R-E, -E, based on the Renaissance Fair, if anybody uh -huh. knows that phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He did his thing back in the early 80s, and he had a photograph of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and um, another friend of mine. It's amazing how many people I know, uh, Dan Kotke, all standing in front of a um, card table with their little box and they were so green that they didn't even think to bring a sign for their company so so jim took a sign and and taped it onto the uh the 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 velvet background so it was like a table with a velvet background or a, not velvet but black background and there's a picture of them just looking clueless trying to sell their computer so again i i, I want to just emphasize that if you look at somebody who's successful you have to realize I guarantee they started out clueless. 
So if you feel clueless, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just do something. And the next day, do another thing. And then and keep your eyes open and be ready to adapt and adjust. Be ready to jump on opportunities when you see them. Right. But don't feel you're, you're, you're behind. You know, mm -hmm. don't, don't feel that because things can change rapidly. Um, speaking of Apple and marketing, this is an important thing for people to know. Everybody thinks Steve Jobs was the marketing genius of Apple. And clearly, he evolved into that. But the original marketing genius was the tech guy, Steve Wozniak. Uh -huh. Okay. And what, 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 Steve Jobs was a hustler, you know, which is a good thing, we, you know. And, and, but he was basically doing was repping Steve Wozniak to all kinds of companies because Steve was, you know, a little shy, didn't go out and really promote himself. So Steve, so Steve Jobs would go out and say, Hey, I got this friend. He could do all this amazing stuff. And then he'd broker the deal, take part of it. And, but it was Wozniak that said, I think we can sell computers, Steve. And here's why. And his logic was genius. There are 50,000 licensed ham radio operators in the world, in the U.S. That means there's at least 50,000 guys that are completely geeked out. We could probably sell our kit because originally they weren't selling computers. They were selling a make your own computer kit. We could probably sell 50,000 of these things based on how many geeks there are who went through the whole ham radio thing. That's how Apple started. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So so on the on the video side, I just wanted video. So for in my newspaper, the very first edition on the front page, I had a, a story on Internet video. This was in 1994. And on the right hand side, I had a story about how the Internet was going to demolish the music industry. And uh, now what was interesting is I had to hire someone to write the video article because I was a little intimidated about digital video. So I went to the head of the special interest group for the International Interactive Communications Society in San Francisco, which was a big thing. It doesn't exist anymore, but this was a huge organization with thousands of people all over the world. And they were all trying to study the idea of interactive digital communications, right? So there was a special interest group in San Francisco and San Francisco was the, the place. I mean, that was Athens, you know, that was, that was Babylon. <laughs> that was, you know, you name a city that has epic resonance. San Francisco was it for digital media. Tech was going on in the Valley in Silicon Valley, but the actual using of it, that was happening. So Hank Duderstadt, who was the head of that, Sig was the guy for, for 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 video, interactive video. So I went, Hank, I want you to write me an article for my new paper on on inter, uh, video on the internet. And he looked at me and said, "What? That's never going to happen." I said, "No, no, I think it could happen." He said, "I don't know. I'll write about the challenges." <laughs> so, so the article is pretty much about all the challenges that had to be overcome to put video on the internet. But in my ignorance, I just assume that if it's a one or a zero, you're going to be able to transmit it. Yeah, maybe not today, happens. maybe not yeah. next year, but you know, so on. So I was a little bit early, obviously. Um, and then the next big thing for me, well, there was many big things, but when when uh, they figured out the video embed code, I uh -huh. I think that is like like the invention of fire, because because before that. Like, I'll tell you how audio, we, we, we actually were the first to do on-demand audio uh, on the internet. Uh, and that was, um, that came from this. And, oh, I, I'm, I, you know, I've been pretty good with names so far. Hopefully I'll come, I'll remember his name. So he came to me and he said, hey, you know, the Flash player? I said, yeah. You know how it plays, you know, little videos? I said, yeah. He, I, I, he said, you know, and it's short. They were very short. Um, I said, he said, if you got rid of the video and just packed it with an audio file, you can put like 20 minutes of audio. No one had ever thought of that. So we created this thing where you could just push a button and get instant audio. Previous to that, you had to get the, the player. It was called real audio. You download the player and then you download the, the, the file, the audio file. Then you put the file in the player. You know, it was just ridiculous. So this was like the first push button audio on the internet. So when I saw these guys had figured out uh, a video embed code that you could just put it on your, I just, I lost my mind with, uh, with excitement, you know? So I went out and started building uh, little websites and one was uh, alternative news. Uh, one called, it's called brass check. 
Uh, and then the other one was uh, Jazz on the Tube, because uh, I love jazz, right? And uh, I had once traveled all the way from central New Jersey, all the way to New York City, just to go to a library, just to take out a video, just to watch a three-minute jazz video. Oh, wow. Who was it was the a whole day. It was who a whole day. Who's oh, the musician? Was yeah. Oh, so cool. And it, that also blew my mind. Um, there's a There was a genius uh, tenor saxophonist named Lester Young. And um, he's from, he's no, he's, he was part of like the, the Cal Basie band. And we kind of think of those guys as old timers, you know, but when they were young, they were changing the world. I mean, they were just setting the world on fire and, and everybody's heard of swing music. Well, they pretty much invented that wow. whole notion of swing music. Right. And he was the, he was the front man on that. Right. So there was this other, there was a singer who he was very good friends with named Billy Holiday, who's just, just one of the great singers of all history. So there was a video of him and her performing together. And wow. I mean, for a fan, when I, like I, I've been listening to these records my whole life. I'd never seen them. I'd seen wow. photographs of them, right? but I'd never seen them play. It's like, if, if, I don't know, like if you'd heard of, I'm kind of outdated in, in sports, but if it, like you've heard of Michael Jordan in basketball and like, oh, he's really good. You know, it's like, okay, but you've never seen him. Yeah. And you actually see him do it. You're like, holy smokes. Right. right. So anyway, uh, video. And so when I, so that when I saw the, the video embed code, I was like amazed. And so I was telling everybody in the internet industry, guys, this is it. Video is going to be a tidal wave. It's going to wash over everything. I mean, there'll still be text. There'll still be print. I mean, there'll still be graphics, you know, and, uh, but video is just going to be. So I went to my friend Ed Niehaus, who had been the PR guy for Yahoo. And Ed, Ed's smart. He was, he was, PR advisor to AOL, Yahoo. When Steve Jobs retook Apple after losing it, he called Ed Niehaus. So Ed, no slacker. And Ed looked at me and said, no, internet's, the video is not going to take over the internet. Um, nobody's going to want to watch video on their on their lap, on their, well, there wasn't even laptops. Well, there were laptops, I think. But nobody's going to watch video on their desktop. I said, I think they're going to. I think they're going to. And the reason why is I know that for whatever reason, human beings are wired to be screen watchers. I don't, you know, I don't know why for the first, I don't know how long human beings have been around a million years. I don't know how long. Nobody seems to know. And we never saw a screen in our entire, all those millions of years. We never saw a screen. The first time we saw one, which was in the, you know, the silent movies, we were hooked. You know, and then when TV came along and, and people said the same thing about TV. Oh, no one's going to want to watch a movie on a little. No, they do. They want to watch movies on little screens. Um, is, yeah. And so I thought, look, we're screen watching creatures. If we can watch a screen. And I remember, I'll never, my other great thrill was the first country to figure out streaming video on a handheld was Korea. Uh, believe it or not. And I saw that and I'm like, oh man, please bring this to, to America. We, we, we need this, you know? So um, that's, that's the history of these things. Uh, that, and then, oh, oh, let me tell you, I'm yeah, sorry. Please, please, so, you know, you know who Perry Marshall is, right? Of course. Okay. So Perry's, Perry's a student of mine, right? Originally. So he invited me to come and speak at one of his events. And this was 2006. And I gave my talk on the video and I, and I gave like seven reasons why video is going to dominate and it's going to just be like a tidal wave and you better get with it guys, you know? And I, and I, and I laid it out. I was very methodical. I was very logical. It hadn't happened yet. So I'm, I'm projecting something that hasn't happened, but I, you know, I said, look, it, it's a good chance this is going to happen. And here's why. So at the end of my talk, and these were smart guys, there were about 250 people in the audience. They were all serious they were all serious AdWords people. They were all bought, spending big money on AdWords. And I said, look, you heard my talk. How many of you think I'm full of shit? How many of you think this is never going to happen? Half the hands in the room went up. So that's where things were in, in 2006. So, there's, so, so to go back to my original theme, there's often a gap between something that makes sense and something that's actually happening in the world. You know, That is um, wild. But, you know, so I'm a media cool. guy I'm, and I'm, I'm primarily a direct response guy, you know, and, and, and direct response says, we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. We're going to put it out there. Uh, we're going to make sure our sample size is big enough. That's a huge issue. Maybe we'll talk about, and we're going to let the market tell us if it's not happening, it's not happening. We'll try something else. 
if it's happening, we want to know it's happening and we want to add fuel to the fire. So the idea of sample sizes, you know, I show, I, I come up with an ad and I right. show it to my wife or I show it to my buddy or I show it to my assistant and they don't like it. Okay. That's not a big enough sample, right? You need to, you need to, in, in direct mail, which I did a lot of before the internet, you need to mail to about 5,000 people to get a, to get a decent sample. Uh, and I heard this great thing from, and I can never remember how to say this guy's name. Uh, he wrote the black swan. Uh, he wrote fooled by randomness. Nassim Taleb. Yeah. Yeah. Nassim Taleb. He has the greatest explanation of sample size I've ever heard. He said, you can absolutely jump out of an airplane at 10,000 feet without a parachute and not worry about a thing for the first 9,999 feet, 0. 0.99 inches. <laughs> right. So if your sample size is too small, <laughs> you're going to have an unpleasant surprise, you know? Um, but or but now on the marketing side, you could have a really pleasant surprise. And you can find out, wow, this thing that I just dashed off the top of my head that I thought was goofy, people are loving it. So one is to know when you've got a message that's not working, but the other side of it is to know a message, know when you have a message that is working. And I'm sure everybody on this call, this is old hat. You already know all this stuff, but it's good to be reminded of the fundamentals of, of what our business is. We're just putting things out there and seeing what the public likes and, and you know, watering the flowers. Um, and that's really, that's really what we're doing. Yeah. And I, I mean, so just to take a, a, a big leap into um what something i thought was super interesting about your your backstory too is um you know corresponding with the man himself eugene schwartz right <laughs> yeah breakthrough advertising among many other classics um just how did how did that happen and what what have you what did you glean from that relationship that's continues to inform all the amazing stuff you're well, doing today. Well, so so many things, and and there's always two things you can glean some from somebody: their technical knowledge, uh, and their character, right? And character, being exposed to someone of great with a with of great character, can be a very powerful lesson. Because you know, technical tricks come and go, right? Uh, the character issues, you know, those are those are lasting. So what happened was, uh, I was, and this is an important lesson for everybody. Um, when I got, when I discovered, see, I had been doing direct response advertising for years and didn't know it had a name. I just sort of, I was starving and I wanted to, I mean, literally, and I really wanted to eat. And so when I did my advertising, I really thought it through carefully. And I, I deduced that the headline had to be good because that was the first thing people were going to read. Right. And then I deduced, you better come out, you know, swinging right out of the corner don't like walk around the block, like get to your message right away. So I did that. And I said, well, you better have an easy response mechanism for people to reach you. Otherwise you're running ads and people can't reach you. And then if somebody does call you, you better make time for them and you better get their mailing address so that you can send them additional information. Uh, you know, all these logical things, which are the, the, the foundation of direct response, but I didn't know there was a direct response industry. That's how ignorant I was. So when I discovered there was a direct response industry and that a few other people had been doing this, I literally read every book on the subject. I spent a year, uh, I just read and read and read. And I have, let's see, I want to show you a book. Yeah, and please. I, I almost hesitate to show this because as soon as this airs, this book will never be, it'll be sold out instantly because it's it's out of print. And um, so guys, you might want to pause the video at this point <laughs> and get this book because I guarantee there's not that many copies left, but this was a really inspiring book. I'll be right back. It's very close. Yeah, absolutely. I keep certain books close at hand. So I, I was in a used bookstore. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And I saw this book. And I was so, it was $10 and I was so broke that I, I, I was lingering in that store for upwards of a half hour. It might've been an hour sort of paging through it going, gosh, should I really get this or not? I shudder to imagine what would have happened had I not bought this book. I, I can't really, even imagine. 
Really? So when I got it home, I realized it was even a better book than I thought. This fellow, Cecil Hoge Jr., who wrote it, his his family had a big um, catalog business. And they were the first people to hire Eugene Schwartz. Oh, wow. That's okay. So, so, so to put this in perspective, Eugene Schwartz was a guy living in Montana. And he came to New York because he wanted to write the great American novel. That was his dream. So he became a messenger because that was a job. It was actually it still is in New York City um, because certain physical things have to be moved quickly. Um, not everything can be digital even today. Uh, but 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 previous to that, there was no, so if you wanted to get something, if you wanted to get a memo or a contract or a photograph or a piece of film from someone, to, you know, you had to hire a kid to do that for you. That was a big job in those days. So he was hired as a messenger boy okay and because he was very smart and he had his eyes open he said what are you guys doing here because <laughs> we're writing advertising and selling stuff really and so he tried his hand at it and within months he was you know setting the world on fire right so i, I learned about um uh, uh eugene and and about a hundred other amazing old school direct response guys from this book so that became my blueprint so I went on a search mission, like I'm going to read, I'm going to either find the guy or I'm going to read his book. I mean, I was deadly serious. And by the way, you know, expertise is gained. That's how expertise is gained. Like if you see a guy with a PhD and all this stuff, all it means is he spent a couple of years or a year or whatever reading intensely. That's all. He wasn't born with PhD genes. Right. I, I, I always try to stress this to people. Like you create yourself. You're not... Um, like, like in the jazz, I got to do a jazz analogy. There was a guy named Charlie Parker, revolutionized jazz. He, he's known for bebop. And the first couple of times he went out and played, he was thrown off the bandstand because people thought he was a lunatic. Really? Wow. And then, and, and he, he had a few flaws in his, his technique. So he went away for a, a summer and spent eight hours a day figuring it out. He wasn't born that way. <laughs> he figured it out, you know? So I just want to say that to everybody. So, um, I, I knew that Gene had published a book called Mail Order, exclamation point. And the publisher was um, Boardroom Books, also known as Bottom Line. I don't know what they, they're, they keep changing. I don't know, they changed their name in my lifetime. So I get confused with, the, with their name. But they were a big company, very successful direct response company selling a newsletter. Um, and they were the publishers of, of the book. And so I wrote to them and I said, hey, could I get that book from you? And um, I heard nothing back, you know, nothing. Oh, I was like, OK. And this is another lesson. You know, you send out 100 letters and maybe one guy answers. So you got to keep at it. You know, even I get discouraged. I'm working on a project right now and I can't believe how thick headed my prospects are. But it's like, hey, it's just the way it is. Keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. You know, so nothing happened. And then on the day before Thanksgiving, a copy of mail order arrives in my mailbox uh, from Gene Schwartz himself. Wow. With a little note to me, N Mr. Nobody, you know, Mr. Like can't buy a clue. He took the, you know, <clears throat> he took this, is the kind of guy he was, he took the time out. Yeah. I guess he had a whole bunch of them. And he wanted to get rid of some of them. <laughs> he was glad that anybody cared, but in any event, he took the time out to send me that book. And that just, I mean, that, it's a 50, it was a $50 book, which these days would be kind of like a $200 book. You know, it was like $50 for a book was like crazy town. Right. Um, and that would have been a lot of money to me at the time. And I was just blown away. So what I did was I donated $50 to this charity. Um, they were doing this really interesting thing. I, I was in San Francisco and a lot of fish are caught in San Francisco and some fish was marketable and other fish wasn't. So they just threw the unmarketable fish away. It was totally edible, but there was no market for it. And so these guys, and, and the reason that they, that was being thrown away was there was no refrigeration to store it long enough to distribute it to food banks and people that needed it. So these guys got together and put some money together. And I thought, this is a brilliant idea. Right. So I sent them the $50, you know, the, and I wrote Gene, I said, Hey, thanks so much for this book. And here's what, it, here's what I did, you know, and then that just opened the floodgates and we were just back and forth writing letters back and forth. And um, it, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. Very inspiring. And so I want to say that to guys that are famous. I know, you, you know, we're all busy and stuff, but uh, it can mean a lot 
to, you know, you can't engage with everybody, but when somebody's like, you know, obviously working it, you know, yeah. Take a minute. Yeah. You, know, you might change somebody's life. You don't know. Yeah. And, and, you know? and it's actually, that's how actually I really learned about you is through Ben Settle. So Ben, someone I've been following for years. And I know um, in terms of email copywriting, email marketing, just direct response marketing in general, he's just, you know, every, everybody looks up to him. And um, it's talk me through that relationship in terms of you know, from, from being a student, Eugene Schwartz, et cetera, to then sort of paying it forward again or paying it back, however you want to frame it. Yeah. Hear more about that. Well, well, yeah, that, that was so interesting. And it's something I, I, I do constantly. I'm, I'm always, people wonder why I know so many people and discover so many people. It's because I'm reaching out all the time and I'm looking, I, I, I'm, I don't know where they have like truffles, you know what a truffle is? It's that sort of mushroom and they're yeah, very expensive yeah. and, and they have these special dogs that could consume. I'm that, I'm that dog. <laughs> You know, I'm sniffing around for truffles. It's like wired into me. And what I'm looking for always are, you know, p bright. I don't mean like, you know, they have a PhD, but I mean, literally bright, like they're bright, they're shining lights, you know? And that's how I met Perry. Perry wrote a letter to um, Dan Kennedy and Dan Kennedy published it in his newsletter. And I read the letter that Perry wrote and I thought, this guy's on the ball. And I looked at the letter and I saw that he had an address and a phone number and I called him up. And I said, hey, you should learn about this internet thing. Because <laughs> no way. Yeah, it's for real, man. If if you're doing this good with, with print, you're going to kill it on the internet, especially because you have a lot of technical uh, clients, right? So similar with, with, with um, I believe it was, you know, I can't remember exactly how we met, but I do remember that he was already a serious student and he was already publishing books. I don't know if these books are even available. I'm looking, I'm sort of looking off in the distance. When walk, see, I, the books that I, are, see, I have these books behind me. Yeah. I have a whole bunch, I have a wall of books over there. Oh, wow. I have, I have a wall of books downstairs. I have a storage unit, 10 by 10 full of books. Nice. So the books that are closest to my heart are in this room. Wow. So let me get the one that, that and I still keep uh, Ben's, uh, one of his original books. I'm just going to walk across. Yeah, right please. Now. Fantastic. Now, do Ben Settle fans know about this book? Oh, I just no, lost your. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. we just came back. Um, no, I don't think so. Copywriting okay. grab bag. This is what everybody needs to understand about Ben Settle. He didn't just fall off a tree. <laughs> he didn't just fall from the sky. This he published this in two thousand and seven. Wow. And I think he'll it, he'll say that he was a struggling copywriter at the time. So instead of crying in his beer about how hard life was he put together a book about copywriting and he published it <laughs> and i thought okay this guy's going places i know it yeah so so i had written um i had done this course called uh advanced copywriting and info marketing the only time i ever did a live training on that two days down in Miami in, um, Oh five. And, um, it was, it's good. I have to say that it's a good course. And I was very, not, I'm not, I'm not lazy, but I was just busy with other things and my energy was going to other places. I'm like, I can't write this sales letter for this freaking thing. So I said, Hey Ben, how'd you like to write a sales letter? <laughs> so and he'll tell you the story. I made his life miserable for a year because whatever he sent me, I, I wasn't trying to make his life hard, but I have, I had a level of standard, you know, for, for copywriting and he was good. Like, you know, nothing, it was nothing deficient about anything he sent me, but it wasn't where I wanted it. So I think it took a year to finally get the letter wow. the way I wanted it. Back and, and think, forth. That's great. Yeah. I think he, he, cause it was, an, I want, you know, I, I never, to me, there's no such thing as throwaway copy. Like, you know, maybe, you know, like even if I'm sending an email, if I'm sending a note to my brother, I mean, I'm thinking about what I'm trying to accomplish, what it, what I'm what what 
energy I'm trying to generate, you know, what action I want, uh, the right wording, the right tone, you know, this is, I you know, like, I'm doing that all the time. This is why, this is why, by the way, I think whatever you do, whatever you're doing in business, you should acquaint yourself with the great copywriters and read their books and take their classes. Um, because it is, it is the Swiss army knife of human relations. It's not just the sales letter. It's the whole thinking process. It's okay. Who's this audience? What's already in their mind? Okay. What outcome do I want? Not just in terms of them ordering or opting in, but how do I want them to think and feel about me as a result of being exposed to this communication, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. Um, so I was very serious about the, the level I wanted that letter to be at. And he did it. He did it. And I think he, he has said, I, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure, that he has said that was a formative experience for him. Yeah. Because there used to be a thing called copy chief, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and now there is a copy chief .com, Um, but, uh, but there used to be you, you like, for instance, Gary Bensavengo, a great, great, great copywriter. Um, his first job, he didn't know what copywriting was, but he had a job and they sent him there and they said, do this. And he did it. And then his boss said, uh, uh, rewrite it. <laughs> uh, people lack that today. And because that's how people used to learn copywriting. It was you, you'd be in an environment where copywriting was going on and there'd be a person that was experienced and they would, you know, take you by the hand. So, you know, we have a, in, in one way, we, we have a tougher road today. Uh, but on the other way, we have a better road because I can get a hundred different copywriting books right. and read them all and right. just soak my brain in it. Uh, but sometimes we miss that 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 mentoring kind of thing. But anyway, that, that's that's the story of, of me and Ben. And then, of course, Ben just, you know, took it and just, you know, now I study him. Like, I, I think he's the best um, headline writer, subject line writer in the universe. Mm. And, and the reason I say that is I get a lot of email. And I know Ben, I know what he's selling. I'm still compelled to read and, and open up half of his emails because the, the 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 subject lines are just so damn good. And and every periodically, every couple of weeks, I just have to write him and I go, You got me again. You know? <laughs> well, the you thing, I mean, he gets his reps in, right? Sending every day. Well, that that that's really important. That, and then, by the way, I taught that in, in my course back in 05. Um, and I did not st start making real money on the internet until I did that. And, and let's address that. Every business is different. You know, for instance, if I have a pizzeria, maybe I'm not going to send an email every day unless, you know, I have a chain of pizzerias and my content is really good. Then, then maybe it makes economic sense. But the thing about sending every day, well, first of all, first of all, let's, let's take it a step back. One of the most important decisions you'll ever make as a marketer is your, is the market you're going to market to. You know, are you going to market to people that don't spend money uh, or when they spend money, they spend it $10 at a time? If so, copywriting is not going to help you. That's a different kind of business. So the ideal is you're looking for a market where you have a, a lot of players. Uh, uh, Gary Halbert used to have this acronym, uh, PWM, players with money. So that's the, that's the market I'm in. That's the market uh, Ben is in. Uh, people that are willing to spend significant money to 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 accomplish whatever it is they're accomplishing it could be a hobby, you know, could be making more money. Uh, it could be investing wisely. Uh, it could be their health. And there are there are a few of these things, right? By you know, martial arts is sort of a subcategory of health in a way, and also uh, cond physical condition. Uh, there are categories. Fishermen is another one. Uh, interestingly enough, tennis players are not. They buy a racket. They get it restrung every now and then. They buy the same can of tennis balls uh, for every game. Golfers, in contrast, are maniacs. Like, I need a new putter. Oh, these balls are much better than the old ones. Um, I need it. I need to go take a lesson with the pro. You know, I need to know that. You know. So, so you're always looking for people who are are bought. And this sounds so ridiculously simple minded, but. And I didn't get it the first thousand times I heard it, but we're looking for buyers. <laughs> we're not looking to teach the world that our product is good. We're looking for people that are already obsessively looking for the next new golf ball or looking for the next new, you know, chokehold uh, or looking for the next new stock or looking for the next new supplement 
or are looking for the next new way to make a million in business. Right. Those people exist. They're out there. They have the habit of spending money. They got money in their pockets. And those are the people you want to mail to every day. Got it. So how yeah. do you get them to raise their hands so that you know who to send to and who to not send to? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm gratified to see that Ben follows the same thing that I do, which is we don't think a whole lot about it. We, we, we raise the flag. And if somebody salutes it, we say, come on along, <laughs> join, join the army with us, you know? And, and so we, we have an opt-in, maybe we're on a podcast or maybe uh, we, we have a, you know, we're buying ads or however, however we're getting those opt-ins, we're making an offer. As soon as somebody opts in, we start mailing to them. We just start, we assume that they're into it. Let them self-select. They may say, I don't want an email every day. Okay, good. Be gone with you. We're looking for the people that are uh, that are fanatics, fans, right? The word fan comes from fanatic, you know, and, and fanaticism and fandom is a really interesting phenomenon. It's entirely unpredictable. It's entirely without rhyme or reason. It's entirely irrational. We have little to do with it. All we are responsible to do is raise that flag. And when somebody shows up, Keep feeding them if they stay, if they leave, you know, good wishes, you know, good luck. Hope everything turns out well with you. But we don't care about those people that leave. Gary Halbert said one of the most profound things. You know, you know who Gary Halbert is? Oh, yeah. I'll OK, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, one of the great. I mean, may, maybe, maybe possibly the greatest educator on copywriting ever, because he would get he, he went beyond the technique. The technique is very important. And there's a lot of good technique stuff, but he goes into the essence of what are we doing here? It's, it, you know, the, the writing is part of it, but there's something uh, on a much, and he was very good at explaining that and getting that into your brain. Anyway, he said this very profound thing. He had a book called How to Make Maximum Money in Minimum Time, uh, which is a perfect title for the audience he was going for. And he would sell the book and he'd say, my book is the great meat cleaver of society. Some people get that book and love me. They read it and love me. Some people read it and are appalled by me. That's the reaction he wants. It's irrational. Why should somebody hate the guy? He just wrote a book. Right. Why should somebody love the guy and make him his guru just because he wrote this? Human beings are irrational. And we love to glom on to experts. That's why there's a celebrity industry, right? That's why you have people magazine and us magazine and everybody's looking at the latest you know people that are into that are looking endlessly about the latest kim kardashian episode it's like that is a completely irrational activity but we are irrational beings so the you don't we don't think so so so, so to answer your question i i don't think about it ben doesn't think about it we're raising the flag we're inviting people in and we're feeding the people that stay and the people that leave, we hey, whatever, we don't care, right? You know, we're just trying to keep, keep fill the tent and keep the tent filled. And we don't like he does. I, I was so gratified to see this. He doesn't even look at, at click through rate, um, and it really is kind of a money in, money out thing. Well, how much you know? How much effort am I putting in? How much money is coming out? What are my sales? Yeah, what are yeah. my sales? I mean, and, and now you can always fine tune things better. And I, and I and I do recommend people do like there's a thing called RFM. Recency, frequency, monetary value. One of the smartest things you can do uh, it, it, is take your buyers list, and hopefully you have one, uh, and a lot of people don't, and hopefully you have the person's name, what they've bought from you, and how often, uh, and, and the dates. And you can then do you know run various numbers. One of the things is recency. How, how recently has a person purchased? Mm -hmm. Uh, they, if you do, see, this all came from direct mail when, when communication cost money. And I was in that business. I mean, I was in that, I, I mean, you know, I would write a five figure check to the post office just to send out one message. Imagine how focused you'd be on your emails <laughs> if it cost you $15,000 to send one. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so people that deal in the physical were, are very in RFM, but that doesn't mean that digital people should ignore it. So RFM says, hey, this guy bought something from me this month. Maybe I should hit him up with another offer because there's this concept of the hot list that's in, in direct mail, which is um, there's a whole big business in renting names and so on. 
And uh, the hot list is people who have bought in the last 30 days. So you can get this much for your list, but if but your hot list, you can charge this much. So that's recency because, you know, in the law of large numbers and the large sample of, of, of life, uh, someone that bought from you this month or this week is more likely to buy from you, something else from you than any other person roaming the earth. So that recency is really big. Frequency is another one. Uh, if somebody's buying, you know, everything you sell, make sure that you hit them up with an offer next time you have something to sell. And you also want to kind of ju juice goose your list. You know, like if somebody hasn't bought in a while and you notice, well, last time he bought was six months ago. Let me spend some money on him or attention uh, to get him back in that frequency loop. If it's possible, it may not be, but you know, the, those are the, so those are your, and then monetary value. You know, if, 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 Everybody, every business should have a list of the monetary value of their customers. Like John Smith over his lifetime has given me $25,750.48. You should know that guy. You should probably know his birthday. You might send him a cake. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, like for instance, in, in my jazz website, let me show you. We put out this book. Oh, oh wow. Nice. Yeah, and it's uh, I'm I'm a big fan of New Orleans, a big booster of New Orleans. I was very involved in in the rebuilding efforts of New Orleans, and I, and I just love the place. And uh, so I I made that book. Uh, so I, I my jazz site has uh, donors. You know, we have supporters, people that are fans, and they send in money. And I have a couple of guys that have given me lifetime over a thousand dollars. Wow! Mm -hmm. I didn't sell them anything. Yeah, I just said, hey, help me support, keep the site going. Yeah. So. I printed a special hardcover edition. I hand numbered one out of a hundred, one out of you know seven out of a hundred. I signed it. I wrote a personal inscription for all the guys that sent me that who 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 you know supported the site to that level. Uh, now it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do, mm -hmm. right? Because yep. I'll tell you this, this is a really interesting story. I can't tell you the guy's name because he swore me to secrecy, but he has a newsletter. It's politically oriented. And he's he's got a following. He's doing well, no question. A lady in Austria died and left him one and a half million dollars. Okay. So just now, let me give you another story like that. And I'm not saying wait around for the lady in Austria to die. That's not a good business plan. But but it is good to know. And he had never corresponded with this woman once. He She was just a, a low-level subscriber. Let me tell you another story. So I, I was a, a volunteer copywriter for uh, the biggest social service agency in, in, in the county here. Because when COVID hit, I'm like, oh, my God, the poor are going to be destroyed. So I went around it. <clears throat> Hang on a second. So I went around and I said, "Who's the who helps more people than anybody else in this county? Because this is going to be a disaster." So I found this agency, and I said, "You need money, right? Yeah. You, do you have a list of donors? Yeah." I said, "I'm a good copywriter. I'll write your letters for you." Took me six months to persuade them to let me write for them for free. <laughs> wow. This wow. is the way the world works, man. Yeah. It's a crazy world we live in. And um, they had usually just sent like a one page letter that somebody dashed off without any thought at all. So yeah. I did a four page. I didn't want to blow their mind. So I, I limited it to four pages and, um, uh, you know, typeset, you know, type, type face, you know, the whole bit. And it was a good letter. I'm very proud of it. And uh, I got to tell you this part of the story. The director had a brilliant flash at the last minute and decided to print it on green ink on a white background. Let me tell you, anybody who doesn't know this, let me clue you in. That's illegible. So they sent out 10,000 letters written by a pretty good copywriter that were illegible. So I had to go to the board meeting and become a a pest mm -hmm. and say, please let's mail it again with, with printed correctly. Uh, they raised over $300,000. It was their biggest influx of, of direct, of uh, solicit that kind of 
solicitation they'd ever had. Wow. Like it was just unprecedented. But let me, so, so here's the, but that's just the backstory. So here's the, another amazing story. So they have a branch in this town. They have a bunch of branches around the county. They have a branch in this town. Across the street was an insurance agency. Okay. The and insurance is a very, if you can stick it out and, and just show up to, at work every day and just do it, insurance is an amazing business to be in. Um, that's why when you go to a big city, very often the biggest building in town, one of them will be an insurance company because, you know, and it, and it works at all levels, a lot of money in insurance. So anyway, this fellow died and he left his home, his two homes and a big pile of cash to this social services agency. He had never given them a dollar before. He had never communicated with them, but he had seen their office across the street from his. He was in his last weeks, his family had been treating him like garbage. And he thought, I'll give it to these people. Okay. You never know. So like, so here's my, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the, the, uh, what's the, what's the, the, um, the moral to this story. You never know when a $5 customer might become a $5,000 customer. Right. And this one example is kind of almost you, you, you can't there's nothing you can do to make that kind of a thing happen. But the fact that you were just in front of the guy. Was enough now, can, now is that was that a daily mailing? By the way, it's kind of interesting to bring this whole service. Was it a daily mailing? No, but it just happened to be that every day that that he was looking social at service was in his face. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's why we should mail daily. Right. Um, <laughs> But, but I want to say this about your customers is you don't know when a $10 guy could become a $10,000 guy. And, and I, I see a lot of, you know, people treating their customers like cattle. Not a good idea. Mm. Not a good idea. And, you know, we kind of fall into that because we're busy. We're running around. If we have thousands of customers. But you got to remember, like, every one of those is an individual. Um, on, it's, it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. Uh, and, and the other thing that, that, that Ben's doing great is he doesn't sell books for 40, $49 or $95. Like he swings for the fences and says, Hey, this is a $495 book. And, and that, which really serves the customer because when they get it, they're going to read it. They're going to take it seriously. Good point. Yeah. 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 That's a really good point. I mean, what, in terms of just want to have, have this question for you and, you know, just in the, on the email side, coming up with content, if you're going to mail daily, how do you even think about coming up with valuable stuff to send every day? Well, Ben has a newsletter about, I think he even has a book about that, but, but I have my own method too, which is similar is you got to have your head in the game. It's like, let's say you're a hockey player, you know, what do you have? Do you, do you play any, did you ever play a sport or you ever interested? Yeah. yeah. In I, I played a lot of baseball. Okay. Well, when it's the season and the game's on, got to have your head in the game. Yeah. And so as marketers, as direct mail people, direct response people, we got to have our head in the game every day. And that involves like I have and, and everyone has this, but I've developed it and everyone can develop it. I have this antenna. I'm like, I'm looking for, in fact, I have it my in my book. Of course, I have everybody's book, but my own. Oh. Uh, I have a book called the system letters book, the system club letters book. Yep. And one of the very first chapters is school, you know, the world is in marketing university and school is always in session. And I can literally from walking from my house to the corner store, just spontaneously discover half a dozen marketing lessons that I can adapt and talk about. So it's, a, it's a muscle. It, 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 it's a capacity, uh, like, it, it, like I, like now in my, now I finally have the time and the, and the, the leisure to learn to play music. Now I'm teaching Whoa. myself how to play the piano. Amazing. And it's so interesting how something starts out really you're hitting all the wrong notes. You don't know what the hell you're doing. And the next like months, not, not, not weeks, but months and as years go by all of a sudden you, you're like shocking yourself at the stuff you're able to do it's the same thing with that that idea flow so you're going to start it's going to be clunky 
Um, maybe you talk about, you know, you got to read a lot. If you're going to be a copywriter, you got to read a lot. Maybe you just talk about something that you read that really struck you and you, and you expound upon it. I, I do that a lot. Hey, I like, I have a, you know, in, in the system club, I have a thing called ask Ken and every week I riff on something. And very often I'm riffing on somebody else's ideas, but, uh, so that that's that's one way to do it. Just riff on something that you read, riff on something that you saw on TV. Um, and the other thing is, and I'm learning slowly. I'm a sl I was a slow learner on this one. It doesn't have to be 100% focused on the product. Sometimes you might just be talking about what's going on in the world, you know, and just talking about it. There's just sort of an ongoing conversation. Got it. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's I love the idea that the, the world is a marketing university. So many lessons to pull if you're paying attention. And schools always inside. Like if I go into a shop and I notice them doing something well, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting how they did that. That's really cool. Or if I see mistakes, like like somebody opened a shop in our village with a big sign, good. And for some reason, he got the idea that it would be cool to have an arrow like built into the, or a pyramid, I don't know, like pointing this way, right? Well, his door was here and he had the sign over his door and this arrow was pointing that way. Hmm. And I kept telling him, I'm like, I think this is going to confuse people. It took about three months. He changed the sign. Um, so, so, but read, read a lot, read a lot of marketing stories. Uh, and that will help. I, I mean, like I always tell people, soak your brain in this stuff. Just soak your brain in it. If you were to if you were to read, you know, 20 minutes a day when you wake up, 20 minutes before you go to bed um, from some great, you know, read Ben's stuff, read my stuff, read uh, Dan Kennedy stuff, read Gary Ber uh, Hal um, Halbert stuff. Um, but th but there's a lot more books than that. And everyone is a lesson. Got it. And, you know, so. I got to pivot slightly here. Pivot. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm and, I'm this king of pivots. I can turn on a dime. <laughs> <laughs> because I have to ask you, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, you being first to really recognize a lot of these opportunities. And I know that, you know, you've been involved in AI and marketing since at least 2018. Um, and I'm just curious, what do you see right now in terms of biggest opportunities that maybe no one's talking about? Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna give people a a hook to to contact me, right? Um, I have a great AI guy that I really really like, uh, and and I'm happy to share his name. But but I you know reach out to me, you know. So so I'm not just giving a but but he's he's very he was a copy he's, he's he was a copywriter himself and a media guy, and has been on it since 2017. So he's not an overnight guy, and. I think the first, the low hanging fruit opportunity, and this this pull, goes back to Gene Schwartz, is research. The, the AI stuff can allow us to do a month's worth of research in a day or a week's worth of research in, in an hour or a day's worth of research in five minutes, you know? And great communication, great copywriting comes from research. Uh, Eugene Schwartz, he when he for instance he wrote a book about bird watching or, or he was advertising a book on bird watching and he didn't just read he didn't just read the book that he was selling he went out he went out and he read everything on bird watching and he found one little cool little hook kind of thing in some obscure journal somewhere and that became the headline for the for the for the ad so he so gene one of the many things that gene did was he cast a super wide net when he was going to go write about a product. And a lot of people are lazy. They'll just write about the product. No, man, you got to know, you got to know every possible thing that you got to throw everything in the pot. You know, I, I, for instance, my, my mechanism for writing headlines, I write a hundred. Mm. And then I'll, usually what will happen is I'll, I'll morph two or three of them together into one, you know, headline. And so that, that ability, and by the way, the trick for doing that is get um, uh, John Capel's uh, tested advertising methods, mm -hmm. fourth edition or earlier, because they okay. screwed it up. As soon as he died, the publisher decided to go off wild and they messed it up. But the uh, 
fourth edition or earlier. And he's got all the formulas for writing headlines. And they're automatic. They're like me me mechanistic, mechanical. And so that you just sit down with that book. And we have something somewhere on, on the System Club uh, where one of my students went through and, and kind of formalized that. That would be a really good product, actually. Uh, but in any event, it, it just becomes formulaic and mechanical. Just and, and you don't worry whether they're good or bad. You just crank them out, crank them out, crank them out, crank them out. And good ones will emerge, you know. And that's this, kind of the same thing with how do you write an email every day? Just come up with lots and lots of ideas. Uh, some of them will be good. Some of them won't be so good. You, you get you get good ideas out, out of an abundance of ideas, not out of, you know, it's not like you, 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 you hit it. You know, you hit the bullseye on the first shot. It's more like you're just scattering all kinds of stuff around in, in, on paper before you sew it to the public and something just jumps out and you go, mm. whoa, that's good. Hmm. And then that becomes that. And that just happens more. And the more and more you do it, the more and more it happens. Nice. Yeah. So, so I, I hope that, is that it? Oh, yeah. oh, so the AI. So I think the greatest benefit for us is th the research component. Mm -hmm. The idea that AI is going to write ad copy if you're if the bar you're setting for ad copy is super low, which it is for most people, yeah, maybe you can get AI to fill fill in blanks, but you're not going to change the world. You're not going to create a multi million dollar business with 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 AI writing the ad copy for you. That's that's a dream. That's a that's that's a fantasy. Uh, that's never going to happen. But what you can do is use AI to to load your brain with so much great data that when it's time to write you have no shortage in fact the problem becomes i got to edit this thing down yeah. not i got to figure out what to say right right well, that's awesome and then um and, and, and by the way I, I hope people have noticed that for instance i i, I still use the primitive version of chat gpt mm -hmm. that thing's the most inaccurate i can't believe how inaccurate that thing is Oh yeah, lots of hallucinations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just yeah, it's been programmed. It's almost like you know there are certain people in the world like they won't admit when they don't know. Yeah. Like instead yeah. of saying, "Gee, I don't know." Like like it, like this is the thing, you're trying to find some place, you're in a town you've never been in. And instead of a guy just saying, "I don't know where it is, sorry." A lot of people will go, "Well, hey, it's down down there a ways, you know." No, it turns out not to be down there a ways. The guy was completely off, but he just wanted to say something. And I feel like that's how chat GPT is. Yeah. Just wants to help. Yeah. Just wants to help. <laughs> but I can't believe the whoppers. I mean, wow, it's not yeah. even remotely. Uh, but, 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 you know, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah. So I don't think it's going to write ad copy. I think it can facilitate the writing of ad copy. Might be, might get your brain going. Um. But I think it's being oversold. I, I do think a lot of low-level, white-collar corporate people that have been sitting around, you know, doing not a whole lot, uh, they might find themselves w without jobs because a lot of what they do could be AI'd or machine learned pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I love the fact that when uh, uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter, he fired 80% of the employees without affecting performance. And I That's think that great. was a wake up call. Did you see, I wonder if you saw this video, there was this, uh, this young woman who was uh, Instagramming or TikToking or whatever, her day at work at Google. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Yeah, the one that was like, she was not doing much. Was she was doing everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. She was talking about her lunch and her break and, right. the, and the quiet room and the, like, what? Um, there's a lot of people like that in, in, on the corporate payrolls. And I think those people are, are going to be in deep trouble. Uh, but, but you know what? Copywriters will never be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Real copywriters. Yeah. Because we, not because we write copy alone, but because we think we're looking at the world. We're going, okay, where is this guy at? What strikes a chord with him? That's a research question, by the way. Right. All right. What in my bag of, of stuff can I put in front of him that's going to strike a chord with that particular person? We've got to go back to Eugene Schwartz again. I mean, he's like, at the very beginning of test of um, breakthrough advertising, he said the most profound thing that we can ever hear. We create nothing. You know, we're we're like the stock trader or we're like the atomic scientist. We didn't create the stock market. We're just in there buying and selling the shares. 
right? There's, it already exists. There's already ebbs and flows. We're just tapping in. The he when he was writing, atomic energy was like a big thing. Um, the the uh, atomic scientist doesn't do anything really, but he did find out that there's an atom and that it can be cracked or whatever it is they do to it uh, and release the power. He didn't create that. He figured out how to utilize it. And as marketers, that's really this is a profound thing. That's what we're really doing. We're looking we're we're looking for existing demand. And we're looking to harness that demand. Uh, I like to compare. I've never, I've been sailing like twice in my life, but I love the sailing analogy is the wind is blowing. I'm not making that wind blow. I cannot do a thing uh, related to wind, but I can put up a sail and I can learn how to rig the sail so I can go in different directions. That's what we are. That's very, very helpful model. And, 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 you know, so when things flop, you go, oh, well, I didn't I didn't set the sale correctly. You don't take it personally. You know, you just say, right. I'll set it. You know. But that's what we're looking for. We're looking to tune in. Um, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Ken, uh, really, it's been an honor having you on the show. And where can people go and learn more about you, get in contact with you? I know you have a, a really very high level group that you run. And I know you have a lot of amazing material to share with people, both on the free side and on the paid paid side. Where would be the best place for people to start and learn yeah, more about? Yeah, and and, and 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 thanks to the inspiration of 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 Ben, I'm I have a lot less free stuff than I used to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I, my 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 act my website is, is all over the map. I mean, I'm talking about everything on the in the world. Uh, the best, but it, if you go to my name, KenMcCarthy.com. K e n m c c a r t h y dot com. Let me see what's there these days. Like I'm the typical uh, shoemaker. You got an opt in there. Not not necessarily not necessarily sure what's on his shoes. Okay. Um, there we go. Boy, I got to change this. But if you if if you go to that my homepage, you can sign up for my. I have to change that. You can sign up for my uh, uh, my list. Perfect. Yeah. I and know you, your book too. Yeah. And then if you go, yeah, this is, this really needs to be changed. <laughs> uh, if you go to the bottom of that page, you'll see a link to books. Mm -hmm. And when you click on that, uh, this needs to be <laughs> changed too. The book to get is the system club letters book. The System Club Letters book. That's the one to get. Everybody raves and, about that from Dan Kennedy to Ben Settle and Gary Ben Savanga, who's who, literally. So just want to Ben, ben, plug ben claims he's read that book um, over fifty times. I believe him because he doesn't he doesn't say things that that aren't that aren't true. Uh, and he helped me actually. And this this and and I'll, and I'll, I'm just this is the last thing I'll say. I wrote that book. I did. I wrote it one chapter at a time they were um this it was messages to my system club members and my wife said gee you got so many of these why don't you put them into a book i said oh i don't have time for that oh my god she did it thank god right nice nice and then the book was out and i'm like hey i have a book this is great and then i forgot all about it and then ben said ken this is a really good book i said is it really i haven't really looked at it in a long time you know so i'm starting to read i'm going whoa this is kind of a good book so this often happens in business, like your best or one of your best things, you don't even realize it's good. The market has to tell you it's good. Yeah. And then that's when you add fuel to the to the fire. Right. So it's 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 unfortunately a little more convoluted than it should be. But if, and we're going to fix this. But maybe by the time this call shows, um, if you go to Ken dot com, you'll see a way to opt into my my list. And then if you go to the very bottom, you'll see a thing called books. And when you click on books, you'll see a bunch of books. And I think we also have a, a book, by the way, this is true, very limited quantities. We're almost out. Um, uh, Gary Bensavenga and I um, kind of collaborated to reprint a book by the great Harry Brown. And most few people have heard of him, but that's a very good book. And you, you could buy both of them at the same time. Amazing. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, that's unbelievable. In fact, you know what? 
uh, send me your email address. Uh, send me your physical address. Uh, I, I, I'm going to send you. I'm just going to send you a copy. I mean, we're really down to our last seven, and I'm what? not going to. Yeah. Oh. It, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh, th thank you and so we much, have a, I guess you guys already know all the amazing things you're doing, but I mean, I'm amazed at what you're doing. And, and, and I hope that we'll have a chance where I could ask you some questions about YouTube. Un uh, absolutely. Any, any time. I mean, our, our, we, you know, we love talking about YouTube. Um, our team is amazing at YouTube and, you know, we've nerded out on this stuff all day. And I just like, I love going back to the direct mail stuff and that book that you shared um, immediately I'm going to be on Amazon trying to find that before we air this so that I can get the last copy. It's fair. It's fair. And don't worry what condition it's in. Get it. I mean, this thing, the, 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 the thing, the pages are falling out. Yeah. The spine's broken. Yeah. Still solid though. Game changer. It okay. is. It's, it's so great. You'll see, you'll see. Can't, it'll make, I, it'll raise your IQ like overnight. Just I, reading it. I, I can't wait. And I, I honestly, I really hope we can do more of these conversations. Um, I think people are going to love it. The amount of history that you shared in terms of the internet, marketing, everything is just insane. And we haven't even really gotten into um, a lot of the, the the marketing stuff that you've done That's that's been incredible as well. So I would love to have more conversations like this whenever we can. But again, been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really, Great, it's been a pleasure. Week. Awesome, Ken. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right. And take care. Thanks so much, Ken. Great. All right. Thanks for checking out the show today. Remember that you can claim your seven day free access to vidtow.com, our app with over 7 million unlisted YouTube ads, landing pages, and funnels. Just go to vidtow.com to start that free trial. This podcast is also sponsored by Inceply.com. Inceply is a direct response video advertising agency, and it's generated over $950 million in direct response revenue for Inceply's clients via video platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Meta, and more. They're experts in both producing high-performing direct response creatives, video creatives, and also scaling the ad accounts themselves, so expert media buyers, and very important, custom deep data analysis to make sure your tracking and attribution is 100% rock solid and tailored to your unique business and funnels. So if you're already spending at least $1,000 per day on ads and looking to take your results to the next level on platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, Connected TV, and more, go ahead and claim a free brainstorm session with the Inceply team. Just go to inceply.com slash vidtow, that's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y dot com slash vidtow, and claim a free brainstorm session. And just so you know, this is not a sales call. On this brainstorm session, the Inceptly team will work with you to uncover insights you and your team can use to unlock new opportunities and scale on video traffic platforms. Just go to inceptly.com slash vidtow to claim your spot. All right, thanks so much for checking out our show and being part of our community. Once again, this has been Vidtow co-founder Ian Naj signing off. Have a great rest of your day, wherever you are in the world, and take care.